Good morning, everyone. So I'm assuming everyone's had their second cup of coffee, so we should be wide awake now. Um, to, my name is Drishti Patel, and I am from the American Red Cross. And I'm a GIS analyst, uh, but most of this past year I've been uh, spending my time on missing maps. Um, today's focus will be on missing maps. Um, there's a lot of information about it on uh, our website and American Red Cross, and there's a bit, been a bit of chatter about it. But today my focus will be on our history and how we came about, because we get a lot of questions about how it started and what we do. Um, and I'm going to share a bit of our story. And a lot uh, of my focus will be on our efforts to start community mapping. Um, and we recently went on four trips, um, starting in February, uh, three countries in Africa, so Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Rwanda. And then we went to Dhaka. So we have a decent amount of experience with community mapping. We wanted to share our story and what worked and what didn't work more so in relates, and how it relates to tracing. Um, a lot of us, everyone here is strong OSM users and probably leaders for OSM in their communities. And you might be the ones uh, conducting mapathons or training others. And we just wanted to share what we felt worked in when we were in the field so it helps guide tracing efforts so that it makes the process all around much easier. So a little bit about our history. Uh, somebody came to our director at the American Red Cross and asked them what we were good at. And so he said, our GIS team is pretty awesome. And they recommended that we start mapping the world. Obviously, the world's a really big place. Um, and so after some discussion, there was talk about starting with the most vulnerable places in the world, which is where the idea of missing maps started. Um, we then reached out to some partners, uh, friends of ours, so, and they were fully on board, loved the idea, and so now we are part with the British Red Cross, HOT, and Doctors Without Borders. So as you can see, if you want to be our partner, you have to have a red logo. Our focus and main goal is putting vulnerable people on the map, so that's where we're starting. Um, the Red Cross has humanitarian uh, efforts all over the world, and so what we're doing with our community mapping is starting in areas where we already have projects. So this goes hand in hand with projects that we're already doing, and we can see directly how these mapping efforts are making a difference in um, the project in making decisions to move forward. Our core ethics is we're open, uh, like all of OSM, so all our data underneath that banner will be free and open and available for anyone to use. Um, and our mission and our main goal when we're going into community mapping is that we see people before our data. And this is really important to some of the areas that we're going in. They're very vulnerable, and sometimes it's political areas. Um, and so we want to make sure that we respect uh, the communities that we're going in, and we have a strong focus on making it so that the data is helpful to them and not only just the goals of like a certain humanitarian mission. So it needs to be more encompassing. Uh, we also emphasize on building and leaving behind local capacity. So just we don't want to just go in, map a bunch of places, and leave. So a lot of our focus is, yes, we want to finish that area that we're mapping, but we also want to create strong OSM users in that community so they can start mapping the areas around them and also you know, become OSM um, ambassadors in their own areas. We're very cautious about rapid data collection, um, and we, we really want local participation. So that's one of our big focuses. A lot of us know uh, missing maps for having mapathons, um, and we try to make them fun. So we want to really engage the youth community. Um, there's a lot of really technically savvy people that want to do volunteer and humanitarian work, and I think humanitarian volunteering is changing. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of people want to do good work and want to volunteer and want to donate their time. And we think that mapping is a great way for them to be involved. So we do these mapping parties, which we try to have fun with. So as you can see, we had our ugly sweater party. Um, the British Red Cross had their version of uh, Christmas parties as well. Um, we also did a Mardi Gras themed. So we try to make them fun, but also we want to teach people about mapping 
um, and the community. And the British Red Cross and MSF in the UK ha have excelled at this. They recently had a mapathon with 900 people from Accenture, which is a company in the UK. So they're really forging ahead with the, the mapathon and increasing the number of volunteers, but also focusing on training to make sure we don't just have numbers, but we also have quality. We've had a lot of schools approach us uh, to participate on mapathons. Um, and it started off as a joke, but ended up being a really great idea. Um, we ended up having a map off. So two schools competed, and then people joined uh, sides, and organizations ended up taking sides as well. And it became this really fun way of uh, getting people involved. And we had almost 220 people participate, which is really great, in just a couple of months. We go through a couple of our statistics. So far, we've had 46 mapathons in 11 countries, almost 2,500 contributors to OSM, roughly 8,500 volunteers have been logged, volunteer hours, approximately 3.7 million edits to OSM. We've mapped 4.5 million people. And my favorite statistics, we've eaten 1,264 slices of pizza, because you can't have a mapathon party without pizza. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about our community experience in Zimbabwe. Um, and since you know, I have 20 minutes to chat about this, I'm going to kind of give you a detailed view, and then as we go through the other countries, add on what we changed. Because we realize when we're in the country, no matter how much you prepare, you do have to adjust to what's going on and kind of uh, change the way you do it. And it's also a practice for us, and so we were very flexible with working. Zimbabwe, um, is in a pro the Zimbabwe Red Cross is in a project with the American Red Cross, and they're doing a long-term integrated urban risk resilience program. The area that was in focus was Zavara Sequa, which is locally known as a township, but it's a high urban density area on the outskirts of Harare. And what we did is we coincide them, coincided these mapping um, just after baseline surveys. And the baseline survey was to identify key issues in those areas so that they could plan for these programs. We started with a five-day training at the Zimbabwe National Training Society. Um, and we invited not only volunteers from Zavara Sequa, um, who had already completed the, the uh, baseline survey, so they were familiar with the area and how to use the Open Data Kit apps. We invited GIS professionals from the city, because it's really important to have that view as well. Um, and they were very interested in o learning OSM for their own uses, because there were a lot of areas that they didn't have maps for. Uh, we had some volunteers join us from the UK as well to help facilitate training. And once we started with the training, we realized we really didn't need five days. Because um, most of the training uh, needs to be more practical. And so we did a lot of, uh, we did a little bit of theory, but mostly focused on practicing what they were going to do in the field. We did, we focus a lot on community discussion. So that's really important because we may have an idea of what is important as part of projects, but you don't get the real true information until you talk to the community. Um, and these were really great discussions. We had them on the first day. It's also a really great way to engage the volunteers into the whole process because it's always, you know, it's, training facilities are always quiet and, and, you know, everyone's a little bit shy on the first day. But by talking about what they know, it gets them to engage into the discussion. And we found some really interesting things from having these conversations. And there was a lot of differences of opinions just amongst the volunteers that lived in the same area. But it was really great to have those conversations because then we came to common ground. And we understood the reasons for those uh, differences in what they thought. Simple things like boundaries of districts or wards. Um, a couple of things that came out of those community discussions, particularly in Zimbabwe, were illegal dump sites. So it's not something you would think to go mapping if you're sitting at a mapping party in the U.S., but in this specific area, it was a huge issue because there were a lot of safety concerns with these dump sites. Um, and they were kind of blocking roads as well, so it also made uh, transportation a, a difficult thing in the area. Another thing where there were many of, you see the kind of uh, temporary shelter. They, was, they started off as temporary, but they ended up being permanent structures. And they were placed in front of everyone's houses. Um, it's a little bit harder to see that when we were doing, uh, you know, tracing from satellite imagery. 
But once we got there, we were able to see it. And so there was a lot of discussion on how to tag these different things. What would they be classified? Um, they are temporary structures, but they had been there for five or six years. So at that point, they weren't that temporary. So these are really great things that come out of discussions that you wouldn't necessarily think about. We took a couple of big maps with us, um, and those are always really nice because you can have everyone draw on it. We, we separated them up into groups, um, and everyone put what they knew on the map. Um, it was a great starting point uh, for discussions as well. Um, and then you start to see the differences, and then you can come again to really good conclusions. What we did before we left with our field papers is actually exported the layer and then printed out on a big map. This really helps with navigation in the field um, because map literacy isn't, is very difficult. So no matter how much training you do, it's always going to be really difficult for um, volunteers to know where to start from um, and just finding their way around, even with all the guides and things that you give them. So this is really helpful. We made a little map mobile, basically duct tape that big <laughs> map to a car and we drove around to every team. So if they were stuck or needed help with directions, they were able to find where they were and we, we would you know, work it out and then we'd be able to continue. Um, we made sure to have every volunteer group prepped with a phone so they could reach us. They each had two phones for actually mapping and doing the open map kit as well as the field papers. Um, we had guides, tracing guides as well. Um, and each team had a staff member as a guide as well, so that would help. You kind of get to learn a lot about uh, the, the community, even though it's a short time, you're spending so much time with people, and it's really great. And we got to learn um, a lot about like the way the, the family structures are as well. And this was one of our volunteers, Nyasha, um, the one with the big cross. Um, and it was really amazing. She was a mother of five and kind of you know, felt like she, she, she was educated, but she didn't have a way to, to give back or felt like she had a purpose. And one of the main things she said was, you know, if I can do this, then anyone can. Um, so it was pretty amazing. And not to start a gender war, but we found that most of the women were actually really good with knowing the area because they're the ones that are responsible for fetching the water, farming, and kind of staying around the area that they live in uh, and usually in these like high density ur urban areas or rural areas, it's the men that kind of leave the, the area to maybe go find a job in the city. Um, so they're a really great resource for information. Again, community relationships are really important. We started off in Zimbabwe, so everyone knows a bit about the political situation. So you can't really roll up and have a bunch of volunteers start taking pictures. So we were very cautious about letting community leaders uh, know what we were going to do, have them involved in the process. Uh, on the first day, we pretty much went around to the different like uh, district leaders. They have a very... Um, important structure that everyone follows. And we would just say hello, let them know. All our volunteers walked around with these uh, permission slips. And so if we, we kind of like were ready for any kind of questions that would happen. But it's really important. And the nice thing with the Red Cross is we have national societies that already have these relationships that are already working in these areas. Um, so it's a really great benefit for us to be able to go in and kind of jump on with these programs because they already have a lot of this established. We found through community discussions that there was a lot of questions about how to tag things. Um, I think someone mentioned in one of the talks yesterday about how we're pretty sure about what, what secondary roads look like and highways, but it's not very clear in Africa. Um, when your entire urban area of a million people have roads like this, um, it's very important to be able to go through. Um, we spent a day just taking pictures um, so that people would know what they would look like and had these guides given out to them. Kind of did the same thing with the houses. Um, and that was us inputting data into um, OSM through JOSM. We use JOSM because Wi-Fi is a huge issue in these countries. You also lose power quite a bit, and so you have to be flexible. This is kind of what the area looked like before. There was nothing there, and we were able to fill it in. Um, and these are just quick snapshots of the results that we saw, and we still need to go through and analyze them more. But it's very clear to see like the, co the correlations that jump right at you um, just by looking. 
And you can see like the housing materials that were, the houses that were made with concrete like were marked as being in poor condition naturally because they wear away with weather. Uh, we then did something very similar in Tanzania. It was also part of a urban risk resilience program. This is the OSM version and the Google. According to Google, no one lives here. But there's actually 1.7 million people in this district. Um, we also had a very similar training. What we added in Tanzania that we did differently was had volunteers recap what they learned the next day. So that was very helpful. And we also were able to see what they were grasping and what they needed more help with. Um, again, with the big maps, it's very helpful. Um, and I cannot express how important this is to engage the community because this is like what they know. And the maps look something like this um, after we're done. One of the biggest issues in Tanzania was collecting water points, we found. Um, and because 15% of this population actually does not have a water source in their compound, and so they spend a lot of time having to travel long distance to be able to get it. You kind of get very used to your room looking like a hot mess because you're charging like a bunch of phones and setting up for the next day. There's a lot of prep work involved. You have to you prepare the field papers, charge phones, charge extra batteries, make sure the computer's uh, fully ready. Um, in Tanzania, we're also really lucky. We did not have as many staff in that area, but we did recruit volunteers that were community leaders that went out with each of our volunteer groups. And this was really helpful. One, because community, um, like having those conversations in the community takes up a lot of time. So having that person who may not have been part of OSM, tra uh, OSM training to go out and be that person that talks to the community, lets them know what we're doing, is very important. And they also help with navigation, because in Tanzania, there's no road names, there's no street names, and there's no house numbers. So just having someone help you navigate through the area is really helpful. A uh, couple of our uh, pictures. This was Emor Nile. He was our volunteer from the Department of Oregon uh, Forestry, and he volunteered with us. Um, so a lot of people ask you why it's important to have uh, building material, and like why are we collecting this if it's a medical program, right? How does this relate? Well, we found that um, in Tanzania, a lot of the people that were part of this medical program lived in housing conditions that were very poor, temporary houses made of mud, and they weren't seeing an improvement in their health, even though they were getting health programming. However, they found that the people that were in permanent structures and brick homes were getting better. So they actually started a side project where they would go through and help rebuild those temporary structured homes and started to see an improvement. So it all relates together in a really interesting way. There's also a different way that houses get built in Africa. You'll see like this was a house that looks like it's under construction in OSM, but it's probably been there for a few years because they even have grass growing inside. This is why it's important to collect really good uh, information about roads because during rainy seasons, um, it also gets very, uh, roads are basically impassable. And so your mobility goes down and because people can't get goods and services, your pricing for everything goes up. One of the challenges we had with the Tanzania was uh, the imagery was a little bit older. So we saw a lot of differences when we got into the field and that confused volunteers quite a bit um, because structures just didn't, didn't exist or there were a bunch of extra buildings. We were able to map um, in, ten day, in four days, uh, 10 volunteers mapped 3,784 buildings. Um, and considering like how hot it is, um, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, the first day is, is really hard on volunteers, and, and you have to keep them motivated um, because it, it's a lot of work. Uh, this is Rwanda. Um, what was a little bit different, it's also a risk reduction program. In Rwanda, there, there were a lot of hills. Um, and one of, their, um, one, of their main one of the main concerns were landslides and drought. This is our quick before and after. Uh, fun volunteer group picture. Um, this was kind of just so uh, we show you how, like, how flexible you can be with whatever you have. You may not have like, great training facilities. Um, we had to do a lot more field paperwork in t uh, Rwanda because our servo was down, and it was the same time Nepal hit, so we, we didn't want to like, 
stress out the people that were responding to that. And we kind of just decided to do it all on field papers, which was nice because we got to see the difference. Um, and so we used a whiteboard and a projector to show them how to do it better. Hills made things very complicated because you couldn't access all the areas very easily. So we're very strategic about how we gave groupings to volunteers to make sure they didn't have to like cross two hills before they get to the next place because you can't really see that in OSM very well. Um, so this is so that they don't have to walk a lot. We use OSM and to have dropping points um, in R Rwanda, so that was very helpful because we separated into two groups because it was such a big area. Um, same thing, we had each group with volunteers, um, and they helped to communicate. Landslides was a huge issue, um, and the day before we started mapping, there was a really big landslide that actually blocked one of the main roads through this area, um, and so mapping took a lot longer because we would have to find the little roads to get to different places. Lots of walk-in. Um, and this is to show you an example of what a field paper looks like without using the open map kit. Because um, you have to collect specific information about every single building, and this wasn't a very dense area, but imagine if it was a slum area, you'd have no space to write. It also gets very complex when you're collecting information. Um, so the app really helped us quite a bit. Uh, the same thing in DACA. Uh, DACA was much harder because it was very dense, um, as you can tell. It was made a lot easier because we relied heavily on a local co-facilitator, Hassan, um, and he was a really great resource because he already had built an OSM community. And this is kind of what the field paper looks like because it's really hard to put in the mixed-use buildings into OSM or even like restructure everything, so that was part of the problem as well. Um, you have a lot of sharing walls, a lot of connecting roofs because of metal sheets. Um, the imagery was also a little bit hard to see because there was a lot of cloud cover. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about our lessons learned. So community relationships, super important. We cannot stress it enough. We want to also build capacity. So it's really important to not just go in, do your task, and leave. We want to focus on building those relationships because those are the OSM ambassadors that are going to help map the surrounding areas and, and bring in uh, more information and help create a better map. We were also able to do mapillary, which is really cool. Um, kind of just stuck a Garmin, G, um, Garmin verb and had it on a timer, attached it to a battery, and that stays on all day. Um, and you travel so much because you're checking on these groups all day. You're going to get, we had videos of pretty much the entire area and every road. It is so much data. Um, we're actually still sorting through it, and then we'll be uploading it soon. Be flexible. You never would know what's going to happen. Um, I got robbed in Tanzania in my hotel room, and so these guys showed up. It was quite an interesting experience. Um, luckily, I wasn't there. But you never know what's going to happen, so always be prepared with backup plans. And have fun. Uh, mapping is really difficult, and you'll see like how challenging it is and how stressful it is. It's the same groups of people that had done baseline surveys. But the first day of mapping, they were like, this is incredibly hard. Like, I am so tired. So sugar retreats go a long way. You have to be, no matter how tired you are, be very motivating and engaging. Because um, we also want to inspire them to collect true data. So it's not just about finishing the goal, but it's also like how to gain quality information versus uh, quantity. Respect the tea time. Um, I kind of fell in love with this, um, especially Zimbabwe is actually my hometown. It's where I was born and raised and grew up. So it was really nice going back there. Um, but I had forgotten about the cool tea time at 10 o'clock and then again at 4 o'clock. So it's really nice. And you want to get into the, to the culture. Um, and you know, if everyone respects each other, the process goes so much easier. Um, you will face a lot of challenges in community mapping. Most of the areas we're in, you lose power almost every night. Uh, you don't have very reliable Wi-Fi, even with the hotspots that you travel with. Um, and this was us <laughs> one of the nights we basically just had headlamps and used our cell phone flashlights to get stuff done. Um, and this was lastly what we used. Uh, I'm a diehard Apple fan, but we used uh, Samsung phones, which are really great for our apps. Um, and you can't really go wrong with an auto box. 
And that is uh, my bit about missing maps. I think we've run out of time, but if you guys have any questions or would like to know more about what we did, um, we couldn't cover everything today. Any of us on the Red Cross team are happy to chat with you. Thanks. <laughs>